Hallo und herzlich willkommen bei Permaglück. Hi. Wir sind mal wieder unterwegs. Ein Event folgt hier dem anderen. <lacht> äh, diesmal nicht ganz so weit. Ähm, wir sind gerade in Weinheim. Wir waren heute bei einem Tagesseminar von Charles Dowding. Für die von euch, die der Name nicht sagt, das ist auch ein bekannter englischer Gärtner, der sich viel mit der No-Dick-Methode beschäftigt, also der Nicht-Umgraben oder die Beete komplett in Ruhe lassen Methode, sage ich mal. Eigentlich auch das, was Richard Perkins letzte Woche in Kiel so ein bisschen propagiert hat. Und ja, super. Super interessant. Ja, und ja, interessant ist die eine Sache, aber unser Problem ist, dass wir jetzt eigentlich nicht mehr genau wissen, was wir machen sollen. Also Jean Montefortier hat äh, eine Anbaumethode, wo er die oberen 5 bis 10 cm des Bodens bearbeitet, also so wenig wie möglich. Richard Perkins bearbeitet auch diese Schicht gar nicht mehr und auch Charles Dowding äh, gar nicht mehr. Die arbeiten eigentlich nur noch mit Kompost als Mulch, auch keine anderen Mulchmaterialien. Kompost ist der beste Mulch, den es gibt und so weiter und so weiter. Und das würde dann, wenn wir jetzt die Methode auch machen würden, würde das bedeuten, wir brauchen keinen Einachser, wir brauchen alle möglichen bestimmten Market Gardening Gerätschaften nicht, weil es viel einfacher geht und wir würden uns ganz viele Kosten ersparen. Aber die Anbaumethode, jetzt fängt es an zu regnen, aber die Anbaumethode ist schon auch anders. Und wir wissen jetzt irgendwie, also wir haben das Gefühl, hm, wir hatten zwar einen Fahrplan, aber jetzt haben wir irgendwie ganz neue Informationen dazu gekriegt und jetzt überlegen wir, was macht man, was genau, wo haben wir jetzt, wie machen wir das jetzt? Ja, ist ein bisschen spannend im Moment. In the UK, uh, a majority now of flower farmers are no dig. It's, it works really well for flowers. Uh, they're using probably a little, little bit less compost than for growing vegetables. Uh, but partly because some of them are on very poor soil. They're mostly not wealthy people. They haven't got the best land. Um, but they're succeeding with flower growing. Um, no dig, because so few weeds, that's the main thing. Okay. So mulching the weeds in year one, you're doing, actually can be doing three things at once, like here. This was, uh, a little plot that Felix worked on actually and we were killing the weeds with polythene and then as well as feeding the soil with compost and growing a crop. So it's clearing the weeds, feeding the soil, taking a harvest can happen all at the same time. But if you use polythene, obviously you can't sow carrots or plant lettuce, but squash like that, courgettes, pumpkins, even potatoes, plants that can be put in quite wide spacing you just need a few holes in the polythene. There's actually only five plants of crown print squash there. And they gave something like 50 kilos of harvest, okay. And in October then, after the harvest, I pull back the polythene and you can see the compost has really gone in. And there's just a few weeds left, which is of course the bindweed. So the bindweed is not killed in one year, but that's not a problem. Some work with the trowel afterwards. There was quite a bit more bindweed here in cooch grass also, but it's not anymore okay <coughs> yep. and here again is the bindweed um, if you're lucky enough ever to be given or have some old woolen carpet it's a great mulch and it uh, covers the weeds very thoroughly and then by the end of year two it's all disappeared because the worms love it but meanwhile it's killed a lot of weeds you can see there the difference that's four months of mulching but what it hasn't yet killed there but it's weakened is the bindweed And that's field bindweed, the one you get, which makes quite low growing and little pink flowers. So that was work with the trial to lever it out. Okay. And then going on, this is year two in that area. So I put on more compost to make beds, some more woody mulch for the paths. So that's spring and autumn. Okay, so very clean. This is year one again about, you know, how you kill those weeds initially. This, this is pretty much my favorite method if I can get enough cardboard and enough compost and it's one I'd recommend to anybody where you're just literally putting cardboard on whatever's growing at the moment that's it just it's a temporary barrier to the weeds growing the cardboard maybe lasts <coughs> eight ten weeks and after that time obviously the weeds can grow through but that eight week time has really weakened them And then they've still got to get through, say, 15 centimeters of compost. So what does emerge at the end of all that 
is pretty weak and you can just keep pulling it out and say even cooch grass um, maybe three pullings uh, over a period of two weeks and it's just completely died and it comes back to that thing if you don't disturb the soil even with those vigorous weed roots it just doesn't have that same need to recover so the the weed growth kind of almost voluntarily slackens it's really working with nature this approach okay and that's that area where there was a lot of bindweed and some cooch grass year two year three so you can see basically how it's become very abundant ongoing there's no more cardboard no more polythene subsequently it's only in year one that you need these special measures okay. this was my greenhouse in year one it had a lot of cooch grass so this is the cooch roots that was actually where the um, builder had dug out some turfs uh, to put in concrete that's the unfortunate bit of a greenhouse it does need concrete there for the wall and then inside the greenhouse I've thick cardboard <coughs> compost on top actually I put about 20 centimeter I put extra in the greenhouse partly because <laughs> I was a bit concerned about you know that much cooch grass uh, but actually if you go look at the next picture you'll see um, this was late June <coughs> and the ground was really clean and I just didn't actually see any cooch grass at all there it just that, that was a subsequent one in the polytunnel, but it, that, this shows how you've got to really watch the edges. Mm -hmm. yes. um, you need a decent overlap where, when you're using cardboard. 15 centimeter overlap, I would say. It's no good just butting them up to each other. You've got to get that sorted. And, and just watch your edges too. And if you see regrowth, this is my favorite method of dealing with it, so that's bindweed and removing just the surface root, you can't get the parent root, you don't need to try either, but removing that much is, is, is a, or taking a lot already from the parent root and making it weaker. Ja, nach dem ganzen Vortrag von Charles, äh, den es dann wahrscheinlich auch in Englisch auf unserem Kanal geben wird, in einem separaten Video, sind wir jetzt hier nochmal zu einem Schüler und einem ehemaligen Praktikanten von Charles gefahren. Der hat hier die Solavi in Weinheim. Das ist eine Art äh, Verein, der sich gegründet hat auf dem Gelände der ehemaligen Stadtgärtnerei. Der hat jetzt hier so, ich glaube nicht das komplette Gebiet, wie ich das jetzt so mitbekommen habe bei dem Rundgang. Der hat hier zwei Gewächshäuser, die er bewirtschaften kann. Ähm, und noch ein paar Außenbeete. Und draußen ein paar Außenbeete und schönes Projekt auf jeden Fall. Und er baut halt alles auf die äh, nach der Methode an, die er bei Charts in England dann kennengelernt hat. Und ich muss sagen, er hat jetzt gerade sein allererstes Jahr hinter sich. Also er ist ein Jahr weiter als wir. Und wenn wir sehen, was hier so wächst und vor allem, wie gut das alles aussieht. Man hat ja schon viel auf den Fotos gesehen in der Präsentation von Charles. Ja. Also Charles experimentiert sehr viel mit verschiedenen Kompostsorten, aber auch mit verschiedenen Anbaumethoden und er dokumentiert das ganz akribisch mit Fotos. Und wir haben ganz viele Fotos gesehen und auch ganz viele Zahlen, wie viel Kilos pro Beet oder ja, dann geerntet wurden. Und es war immer besser mit seiner Methode. Und das überzeugt dann schon ein bisschen, wenn man so viele Fotos sieht und, und man sieht auch, was hier so wächst, wenn man das quasi nachmacht, ja, dann kommt man schon ins Grübeln. Hier ist ein anderer Kompost-Trail, wo 
the base was the same, and then just the top five centimeters was different compost. That's homemade compost homemakers on top. This was some I was given woolen bracken from farms in northwest England. That's green waste compost, and the other one was a mysterious sack full of called itself stable manure, and it looked sort of kind of like grass, dried grass. Okay, you don't always know what's in a sack if you get it, but they can see much paler colour, and then grow the same crop in each of those four squares. Um, generally, the strongest growth was in this one, actually. That's wool and bracken. It's, a, it's, it's for sale as a multi-purpose potting compost, so it should have been good, really, and it's also very expensive. Compared to which, the homemade compost... In fact, the next picture shows you the table. Yeah, that's the result. Um, you know, these trials, are, they're not really... Uh, they're not scientific, it's not really a proper trial if you like, but it's a comparison, it's just indicating differences and suggestion what's good and what's not. Okay, yeah, the next picture on the table. <coughs> so you can see the Dalefoot's the name of the farm where they make it, it's wool and bracken, and that was quite a bit the strongest, homemakers, seven months old compost was pretty good and the other two not so brilliant. Okay. Und ja, man kann ja vor allem nicht mal sagen, dass er irgendwas probiert, zu vermarkten, wo er von, wo er was von hätte, dass er jetzt sagt, das ist besser, diese Methode ist besser, diese Methode ist besser, weil er irgendein äh, besonderes Tool, also Werkzeug, ja, weil oder er irgendeinen Gewinn sich davon erzielen würde. Nein, er macht ja einfach selber nur bei sich zu Hause macht er die ganzen verschiedenen Tests, weil er selber sagt auch, ja mich interessiert das mal einfach mal, was passiert und er macht ja alle möglichen Tests, sogar äh, äh, Fruchtfolgentests. Ja, also was passiert, wenn man in meiner Anbaumethode, wo also nichts umgegraben wird, wo nur Kompost verwendet wird, wenn ich da einfach mal die Fruchtfolge nicht beachte, wenn ich Jahr für Jahr wieder Kohl und wieder Kartoffel und wieder immer das Gleiche auf denselben Standort pflanze, was passiert da? Und er hat gesagt, nach vier Jahren erkenne ich keine Krankheiten. Ja, er sagt zwar klar, eine Fruchtfolge ist auf jeden Fall nicht schlecht. Das ist nicht jetzt, dass man das verteufeln sollte. Das ja. ist auf jeden Fall gut. Aber er, hat, er wollte einfach mal wissen, was passiert, wenn ich das jetzt mache, wenn ich das jetzt so mache. Und der ist in Sachen Experimentieren ist der echt top, der Mann. And carrots, sowing carrots, or growing carrots generally, I find one of the more difficult plants, just because they're so susceptible to slugs, particularly the spring sowing. So. Having no slug habitat, my main approach to slugs is having keeping the habitat to a minimum so that they don't build up in population. And that was the carrot, first carrot harvest, 31st of May. And you can see how they it was a nice crop. That is Bingenheim seeds. So I use Bingenheim uh, biodynamic seed a lot. Uh, I find them really excellent. They're definitely my favorite seed company. I'm really impressed by their seed selection. Seed maintenance, the maintenance of varieties for one thing, and, and the general vigor and quality of the seeds. Okay. No dig potatoes. So this is a root vegetable. It's not really the same as carrot or parsnip. It's more about growing at the surface. And in this case, I'm putting the seed just on the ground with compost on top. So that's the kind of earthing up, if you like, with compost. Okay. And then at harvest time, you can see how the tubers have developed in the compost the roots have gone into the ground so it's often said that potatoes need loose soil to grow it's not actually true they only need loose soil for the tubers to develop in but potato plants root very happily into undisturbed soil so this was no dig clay beneath that surface there and the potatoes have rooted into it and used the any nutrients and moisture they need from that clay as well as what they're finding in the compost which is also the compost is what's helping the potatoes giving them somewhere to swell okay and stopping them going green and I often get asked like you know how do you dig your potatoes uh, it's actually a false question because the word dig doesn't need to be in there you know how do you harvest your potatoes should be the question and the answer is by pulling so hands around all the stems pull because the tubers are quite near the surface and they're, they're quite loose in the surface compost Whereas the roots are firmly into the ground below. There's no doubt about that. Um, so it's two different aspects of how potato plants develop. Okay. And what I love about potatoes is just their sheer speed of growth. So this is, uh, yeah, let me see, that's late June actually, that photograph <coughs> from potatoes that were planted on the 12th of April. 
So that's one and a half months to do that and then give a harvest. And this variety, particularly Charlotte, which I gather is grown here a bit, but similar, the main thing I, I look for is a second early type because they do most of their growing very early, uh, but they also store very well. They store better than first earlies. So Charlotte, which we harvest mid-July, even early July, and I just put it in paper sacks in the shed and it's available to eat as a food until March. So from one harvest in July, you've got food for eight months after that. And then because you've taken the harvest in good time, you've got time to grow a second crop after the potatoes. So as well as 42 kilos of potatoes there, there's time to grow maybe 25 kilos of leeks as well in that same bit of ground in the same year. Again, without putting any more compost on for the leeks. <coughs> and these leeks were sown in April. So very good time to sow leeks is second week of April. Don't sow them too early, you risk them maybe flowering. And I've grown them in modules first, multi-sown and then potted into pots to transplant as quite big plants. Okay. Schaut doch einfach mal auf seinem YouTube-Kanal vorbei, den verlinken wir euch mal unten, weil Charles steht auch vor der Kamera genau wie wir und hält alles, was er macht, fest. Und sein Garten sieht auch wunderschön aus, ne? wie aus dem Bilderbuch. Es ist auf jeden Fall mal wert, da vorbeizuschauen. Ja. Ansonsten würde ich sagen, machen wir uns jetzt auch auf den Weg. Jetzt hat es gerade mal aufgehört zu regnen. Wir kommen ins Auto, ohne genau. das zu werden. Genau, <lacht> alles klar. Und wir hoffen, ja, es war jetzt nicht so viel zu sehen hier, aber es hat euch ein bisschen gefallen. Ihr habt auf jeden Fall einen Eindruck bekommen und ähm, noch mehr tolle Bilder von ja, einer ganz neuen Anbaumethode seht ihr dann auf Charles' Kanal. Genau. genau. Schaltet beim nächsten Mal wieder ein. Macht's jo. gut. Ciao, ciao. ciao.